Can I help you? Ooh. What is happening? What is happening? Oh, there's a plant. There's a plant. Oh, there's a flower. Hello here. I am Becky from the Pecosphere. Thank you for coming back to my channel. If you still like me and you haven't done so yet, go ahead and hit that subscribe button below and like this video as we're going to cover everything wildfires and things that many people need to know. So here we go. This year in California alone, we've seen 4 billion acres burned. And as a result of that, 31 people have lost their lives to the fires. And that doesn't include those who have possibly died from smoke inhalation. According to a Stanford study published this year, smoke inhalation might have resulted in 3,000 deaths in California alone over this last two month period. A lot of the people who die from smoke inhalation generally are over the age of 65 with pre existing health conditions. The certain virus that I am referring to also has hurt the normal systems that would go and fight those fires. This has impacted other parts of the world too because other parts of the world are also burning. While the United States primarily is focused on its domestic burns, which include basically all over the West Coast and parts of Colorado, in other parts of the world there's still a lot of fire going around too. For example, the Amazon, it's burning. It seems like it pretty much hasn't stopped burning. In addition to that, Syria is on fire right now, as well as the Arctic Circle, which has already crushed its own record from last year by burning 35% more. <sighs> oh, and also Northern Queensland in Australia is also on fire again. So we have a lot to cover. Each wildfire burns slightly different and has slightly different variables impacting it. And in order to kind of narrow down the topic I'm covering, I'm going to primarily focus on the California wildfires. However, a lot of the topics I'm going to talk about definitely carry over to other wildfires around the nation and around the world. Specifically, I'm going to try to answer these questions. Are wildfires natural? When and why did wildfires become villainized, particularly in the US? How does human development factor in? What parts of climate change impact these wildfires and by how much? And how can we mitigate and adapt to the wildfire season? Each part of this topic will be timestamped in the description below. Let's go ahead and get started. We often assume that without humans, the world would be a lot greener, but that's not always the case. For example, in California, the mountaintops around the area were usually covered more with patchy chaparral, chaparral being evergreen shrubs, bushes, and tall trees. Here is a TED talk that kind of explains this a little more, featuring research landscape ecologist Paul Hesburgh. The best word to describe these forests of old is patchy. The historical forest landscape was this constantly evolving patchwork of open and closed canopy forests of all ages, and there was so much evidence of fire. And most fires were pretty small by today's standards. And it's important to understand that this landscape was open with meadows and open canopy forests. And it was the grasses of the meadows and in the grassy understories of the open forests that many of the wildfires were carried. There were other forces at work too, shaping this historical patchwork. For example, topography, whether a place faces north or south, or it's on a ridge top or in a valley bottom. Elevation, how far up the mountain it is, and weather, whether a place gets a lot of snow and rain, sunlight and warmth, these things all worked together to shape the way the forest grew. 
And the way the forest grew shaped the way fire behaved on the landscape. It's important to maintain the ecosystems that already exist because they have been adapting and perfecting their methods for a long time. According to Hesburgh, for California, this form of patchy vegetation helped reduce large wildfires, which are kind of like the kinds that we're seeing now, as well as disease from sweeping through the whole area. Space between chaparral sections help keep disease and wildfire from spreading throughout the whole area. Instead, it would stay primarily in those sections. So fire, when it went through certain parts, it would not sweep through the whole land. I swear I'm not torturing him. He's doing it to me. He's biting my knuckles. You're biting my knuckles, evil demon. Evil demon. Lucifer. 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 So yes, wildfires do play an important part in California's ecosystem. It has grown to live and adapt with the wildfires and the wildfires are kind of used as a way to restart the local ecosystems. However, the current wildfires that we are seeing are not natural because we don't have the separate little patches anymore. When logging came in and took the larger old growth trees, then smaller bushes and trees took up the place, making the area more dense. This resulted in the wildfires being able to sweep completely through. And any old growth trees that lasted struggled to survive these wildfires because they burned hotter having more fuel accessible. In addition to that, humans in this area now, because European settlers had kind of conquered the area, so the whole control burn idea stopped. As a result of that and fear of fire, which we'll talk a little bit more about how that developed in the next section, the areas that used to be patchwork filled in and, in, and the new age of fire suppression began. So as I said before, wildfires in the area help detox the local vegetation. So why would you suppress it? I guess a possible obvious answer would be that humans are trying to keep danger away and danger comes in the form of fire sometimes. And I'm not a psychology major, but I mean, I could see that being a point for sure. But another reason is because wildfire once terrified us in what was known as the big burn. And then something happened which caused a sudden pivot in our society. In 1910, we had a huge wildfire. It was the size of the state of Connecticut. We called it the Big Burn. It stretched from eastern Washington to western Montana, and it burned in a few days three million acres, devoured several towns, and it killed 87 people. Most of them were firefighters. Because of the Big Burn, wildfire became public enemy number one, and this would shape the way that we would think about wildfire in our society for the next hundred years. Thereafter, the Forest Service, just five years young at the time, was tasked with the responsibility of putting out all wildfires on 193 million acres of public lands. And they took this responsibility very seriously. They developed this unequaled ability to put fires out. And they put out 95 to 98 percent of all fires every single year in the US. And from this point on, it was now fire suppression and not wildfires that would become a prime shaper of our forests. So as you can see, it's only been recently, comparatively, that we have started to suppress these fires. 
And it's interesting when, I mean, even I look back because I remember seeing Smokey the Bear on TV, only you can prevent wildfires. And to some extent, Smokey had a point. Because we had been suppressing them for such a long time, fires now would be much worse than they used to be when they were able to move through the ecosystems naturally. The fires would burn hotter, farther, faster, and do more damage because more humans were in that area. One of the main points that the Trump administration has specifically focused on is fire management. And as we have spoken before, there's definitely a role to play. However, one of the main things that is of issue is that right now it's kind of being all talk, no show. And to some extent, states are responsible for controlling their own forests and fires, but California in itself actually only owns 3% of the forests that are burning. The federal government actually owns 58%, and the rest of it is private industry, with 14% of that being logging industries. So, with slate, so state legislature unfortunately can only go so far. That's another example of why it's important to vote, because the federal government actually controls a lot of California and the West Coast land usage. Now let's go into part three. How did human development factor in? Well, as of now, in California, 25% of California population is in a high fire risk area, also known as the wildland urban interface. For one thing, that makes it be a bigger deal for humans because now there's a bigger chance of life and property loss. In addition to that, humans unfortunately are really good at accidentally or on purpose starting fires. 95% of wildfires annually are caused either directly or indirectly by humans. This might be a little lower this year because of the unusual lightning storm that came in through California starting a lot of the fires. PG&E has provided guidelines on how you can keep your personal property safe. Because as I said before, a quarter of California population is at risk. So one of the things that is actually required now is to keep 100 feet of defensible space between your house and any neighboring wilderness. I will leave a link below for those requirements. On the flip side, California has vowed to hold PG&E more accountable because PG&E unfortunately did start a lot of the wildfires just a couple of years ago. Last year, California established a wildlife safety division in the Public Utilities Commission to regulate energy companies such as PG&E and make sure that they stay up to date with their safety protocols. So at this point, we have been talking about mostly land management and human development aspect. But by doing so, we haven't even talked about the biggest part of the problem, and that is climate change. As shown from this graph, climate change is responsible for doubling the amount of wildfires that we would be expecting if climate change wasn't around. So by ignoring the climate change issue, you're ignoring over half of the problem. So let's get going on the climate change part of it. So how does climate change impact the wildfire season? Well, you first have to look at how the oceanic and atmospheric cycles are starting to change due to the warming of the climate, which of course is caused by an increase of greenhouse gas emissions via burning of fossil fuels. Humans have released more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, in addition have resulted in less carbon sinks available by deforesting the forests around. So that's a great uh, combination of things. And what happens when the earth starts to heat up, in this case, it's heating up a hundred times faster than we've ever seen in earth's history, then it will also decrease the speed of 
atmospheric and oceanic systems. And those atmospheric and oceanic systems push different weather patterns and systems through. Without them, the weather systems stall in one area. That is why we are seeing these dry, hot seasons in places like California and Australia lasting so much longer than they used to. So what happens is during the winter time, we experience more flooding, which at first vegetation then goes, woo, we're enjoying this, and it grows up more. But then by the time summer comes along, there's no snowpack to quench the new vegetation's thirst and they die off. Suddenly, there's so much more kindling than there would have been without climate change. And you have hotter temperatures than normal, making it very easy to spark a good fire. So to review, think of our poor forest management kind of making the earth smoke, hurting its lungs. And then on top of that, the earth now has a virus with a fever. And so all these things come together and they make each other so much worse than they would have been on their own. And that is where we are at. So the way that we need to combat this issue is by tackling all those different parts. And that leads me to the last section, which is what can we do to help mitigate the problem and adapt to the growing wildfire season. So the first thing we need to do is we need to rethink how we live with fire. One of the easiest parts is those who live in the high fire risk areas, they need to know that they are in a high fire risk area. And when they know that they are in a high fire risk area, they're then able to make a plan. So that might mean making sure you have the correct fire insurance, making sure that you're that you maintain a defensible space between your property and the local wildland and making sure that you have a plan in case you do need to evacuate. Something that's crazy to me is that those who do lose their homes during those wildfires, these wildfires, the ones that are burning twice as many acres that would normally be burnt without climate change, this is an exact example of what a climate refugee looks like. So we need to call it what it is. When someone loses their house due to a wildfire that is from an unusually hot and dry and long season, they are a climate refugee. They exist. We've begun. There's also more areas in which there can be climate refugees and we will get more into that from other videos in the future. But yeah, so we need to call it what it is. If they lose their house to a wildfire season made much worse by climate change, congratulations, they are a climate change refugee. Now, what does that mean? That means that we need to take this problem seriously in the form of decreasing our greenhouse gas emissions and also preparing the forests so that they are less likely to burn as hot and fast as we have seen. And then that goes into the forest management aspect because that definitely does have a role to play. But again, keep in mind that the state of California itself only controls 3% of the forest that can burn. So we need to have people in office from state and federal that are able to listen to the scientists and actually follow through with ways to reduce our carbon emissions and to thin forests and conduct controlled burns. If you feel like voting in itself is not enough, individual actions do somewhat make a difference. For example, you can choose not to drive as much in your gas guzzling car or go on a plane flight, which you shouldn't be doing anyways because we're in the middle of a pandemic, and also just reducing 
how much electricity you use, if you're able to get solar panels up, get solar panels, talk to your local energy people to see what type of energy source your energy is coming from. Is there a way for you to switch it to renewable energy? There's many things that people can do through public pressure. But voting is a good one too because it's a lot easier to pressure someone who believes in the science. And when fires do hit, we are getting better at figuring out how to predict the wildfires through computer software that looks at different weather stations to determine where fires are most likely to start. And we have better equipment for firefighters to stay safe and to be able to see through the smoke. For example, virtual reality glasses are now being used in some fire departments to help the firefighters see through the smoke to the fires. We are also using heat sensors on airplanes to be able to see the fire through the smoke. So that's another way that wildfires are being better fought. That being said, there's an issue with the current firefighting systems that we have created for such a long time because the fire season seems to almost be unending at this point. And that makes it really hard for fire stations to recoup, rest, and revamp their resources to start the next fire season. They have less time in between. So that might mean that we need to reevaluate how we are fighting these fires and looking at how many people are hired for the job. So that being said, if you are an able-bodied person, consider becoming a volunteer firefighter. That's another way that you can help your community. That's something that I'm considering doing next year in my area. And besides voting and looking into how you yourself can help either decrease your own carbon footprint or make it less likely for your home to be at risk for fires or helping to fight fires when they do happen, we just mostly need to talk about it too. Because again, it's a scary issue, but we talk about depressing stuff all the time. I mean, come on, we're kind of a morbid species in a way. <laughs> so we need to talk about this issue more because when it enters into the community consciousness, then it's less likely for politicians to ignore. We will then be able to move on it because we will prioritize it as a real issue that is happening now. So my usual spiel, talk about it. Talk about it every day. If you would like to learn more about why we have ignored this issue for such a long time, then join me on Thursday because we are doing the book club and talking this time about Don't Even Think About It by George Marshall, which talks about why we have been ignoring climate change for such a long time. If that interests you as something you would also like to read, then go ahead and click the link below in the description to buy your own copy and join me on Thursday. We're going to talk about the first three chapters. And with that, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it was informative. Please give me any comments below on anything else that I might have missed or other topics that you would like me to cover. As always, talk about climate change, vote, and take care of yourself. I will see you all on Thursday at the book club. All right. See ya.